I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 to 40 minutes with women, women of color, non-binary and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in tech by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior, and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge a gap between schools and workplaces by getting into the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash the full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voices of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians, raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive, diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture to retain diverse talent so we keep the workforce power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Representation matters. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guests, Tech Queen Winifred Patricia Johansson, Senior Vice President Commercial Affairs at Quantifuel. Hi, Winifred. Hi, Jasmine. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very happy to have you joining us from Norway today. How is your morning going? Oh, my morning is beautiful. It's a lovely autumn day and wonderful colors. Just a bit cold, but just perfect. I'm glad to hear. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus question. Absolutely. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? Bubbly, laughing, serious. How would you describe your life in three sentences? Adventure, fun, stimulating. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? Depends on the mood. I listen to everything. What's your personal motto? Get there or die trying, 50 cents. What is your favorite book? I'm a bookinist. I tried to choose, but I couldn't choose. I've got too many favorites. What is your favorite podcast? Right now, I think Brene Brown, Daring to Lead. But otherwise, again, I'm a grazer. Mac or PC? PC, definitely. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. I love being alone. And most people don't believe I'm not very social. What is your hidden talent? I can sing, but I only do it when I really love somebody. If you were to write a book about your life, what would the title be? The Misadventures of a Dummy. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. Now, I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Uganda and in Norway. What was your dream job as a child? Oh God, as a child, I wanted to be a physiotherapist. I wanted to have an orphanage with disabled children I could bring back to health. What was your favorite subject in school? Science. What was your least favorite subject? Arts and crafts. It's the worst grades I ever got in my life so far has been in needlework. Not good at that stuff. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? My earliest memory of technology is when I got uh, a magnifying glass. I must have been seven or eight years old. I used it to condense the sun rays and actually set fire to my grandmother's farm. 
which were the three first technology gadgets you own? Well, my magnifying glass was always my favorite. That's my first and most precious. And then definitely Walkman and a ghetto blaster. Who was your role model growing up and why? My role model was my grand aunt, Sister Corina, and she was a nun and a physiotherapist, and she had an orphanage and people often left their disabled children at her gate and she would work on them and support them and get them to walk or to be able to function by themselves. And so being able to heal or to create things that would heal like wheelchairs, that was my dream. How do you think then where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your career and education? I was from a family where education was important. And fortunately, I did well at school, so that was not a problem. My parents encouraged me. They never made me feel like there was anything I could not do. I went to a girls' school in my early teens that was run by really great nuns. And they taught us that there was nothing a man could do that a woman could not do. You know, being a Black woman or being a Black girl was no excuse for not excelling in life given the right possibilities. So we had access to everything, all the libraries, to laboratories, to gadgets, equipment, science competitions. And and the most of was just to be self-reliant. And being a woman was good enough. Powerful. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe pick me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Winifred, I want to know the choices behind your career path. Where and what did you study at university? I mastered in applied mechanics of solids. That's fracture mechanics. I can break things, so know how things break or how things fall apart. And no, I did not know that that's what I wanted to be growing up. I wanted to be a physiotherapist and then I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But then the whole sight of blood and really sick people and puking people. And I volunteered during my school holidays in Red Cross Center. And the suffering of man, I just cried and cried and cried. And I thought, you know what, I can't carry this emotionally. So going into mechanical engineering was safer, emotionally at least. Who and what influenced you to get into your choice and feel them? Actually, it was the coincidence. I went to the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim studying petroleum engineering, but I always slept during geology and half the class usually slept during statics and dynamics. And that's when I was awake. And there was this old professor, Jan Lakeske, and one day during the break between two lessons, he said, oh, child, are you sure you're in the right faculty? You're the only one awake in my class. So I went to uh, the faculty director and I might be in the wrong faculty and like, yeah, you could be in the wrong faculty. And so I applied and changed to mechanical engineering and that was absolutely the right for me. So yeah, coincidence. What professional roles have you had before that led you to the current one? I started my career in the automotive industry in Sweden, responsible for sealing equipment in uh, base engine gaskets, O-rings and stuff. And I remember coming in the second day, I had meetings with my clients and I was holding the drawings upside down. I didn't know what was what. I didn't even know what I was looking at. I moved from that to crankcase ventilation, but I didn't like the idea of being manager at such a young age. So I went back to the more academics. I was a crash safety analyst for side impact and rollover. Then I went on on to engineering standards. And after seven years, I wanted to have a couple of years in automotive, ended up seven years there. And then I was headhunted to oil and gas, the subsea operations, where four years in a very technical role, and then eight years in a very commercial role before I was headhunted again to where I am today. What does Quanta Fuel do? Quanta Fuel does chemical recycling of uh, low value plastic waste. Basically, the plastic that cannot be mechanically recycled and used is put through a pyrolysis process where it is converted and the monomers are treated and converted back to liquid that we use again as virgin oil. What is your title and what is your main responsibilities? I'm a senior vice president for commercial affairs, and it is definitely not tech per se. I work a lot with contracts and partnerships and stakeholders, policymakers and that sort of thing. So I would say I'm more working with people right now. How did it get your current role? 
A headhunter called me and he said, I think I've got a role that you will love. It's just as chaotic as can be. It's just at its growing stage, still at founder level almost. And um, I wanted to create something. I wanted to be a part of something magnificent. And I wanted to be a part of something that created value for the future. And plastic waste littering was something that really bothered the shit out of me. So being pulled into this company for me was, okay, it's a match. Yes, uh, it's startup, uh, a lot to do. I can have lots of different roles in it. I get to work on something that irritates Christianity out of me. So yeah, so it gave me purpose. What does a typical right day look like for you? It's very people oriented. Lots of meetings. No two days are the same. Sometimes you're in contract negotiations. Uh, sometimes it's just meeting stakeholders. But a lot of it is about talking to people and trying to build solutions that uh, everybody can agree on, where everybody can grow to develop something that's grand for the future. I love the quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. The winner of it. What do you love about your role? I don't always subscribe to that quote. I say, choose a job based on something that drives you mad so you can just do it. Uh, what I love about my job, there's a sense of purpose. Plastic pollution is something that I feel very strongly about. So working gives me a sense of meaning and it's my way or, or my little contribution of trying to save the planet. What is the best experience you had in your current role so far? Any examples? I have met some of the smartest people in the industry in my current job. Some of the most forward-leaning, thinking, creative people that you face one hurdle after the other when you're starting up a new process industry and how they just rise up and just get things done. And what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far and how did you tackle that? Oh God, when you start a new process industry, challenges are everywhere. Before you point to one, you've gotten another. Um, how we've tackled it with a sense of humor, you can tackle anything. And with good people around you, when you have an environment where you're not finger pointing, you're not blaming, you know, you're not trying to crush anybody. It's okay. This is broken. We are going to fix it. What can we do? And everybody rolls up their sleeves. That's how we've managed the challenges uh, one after the other. But uh, our challenges have been many and the well plastered in media as well. What do you wish everybody understood about your role? It all starts and ends with people. What is the one common myth about your profession or field that you want to disapprove? So many myths, but actually, I think we're just good people. This room for everybody. I think there's that myth that, oh, we are rivaling this company or this company is doing that. And well, no, there's the cakes big enough for everybody. So if you've got a grand idea on chemical or plastic recycling, please get on board. So we're not building walls and fences. We're trying to build a robust industry together and move to the next frontier. So that's the myth, actually. No, we don't hate anybody. What do you love about working in the tech industry? There is something that is so unique and fun with tech people. I don't think we have a sense of self-importance or entitlement that makes us very easy to get along. And there's a lot of humor in the workplace. And that's what I miss when I'm in other environments. Tech is about what you know, what you can do, and you can be who you are, what you are, what you look like. That doesn't usually matter. Do your thing. That's what I love about it. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. The Winifred, what have by far been your biggest achievement in your career? I think I can put that to a contract that I negotiated and won, actually in the midst of a downturn where a lot of people lost their jobs. And because of that contract, a great many people were not fired. And when that came through, I fell on my knees and I sobbed like a baby because, again, I loved these people I worked with. I loved these chaps on the floor. I loved the welders and, you know, walking to the floor. I knew their faces. It wasn't strangers who would lose their jobs. It was people I knew. And so when I tried to look through my career, that moment when it came through and I'm alone in a hotel room and I'm sobbing like a baby, that sits with me. What the biggest factors help you become successful? Any success habits? People. Uh, I think I'm good at talking to people. I'm good at relating with people. I'm a people's person. 
And my success factor is actually eating. I eat a lot with people. Uh, that may sound very strange, but actually food is a very uniting factor. When you sit down over food and you eat with somebody, you build a stronger bond and a stronger relationship. And every business is person to person. It doesn't matter which giant corporation, they're still represented by people. And when you can meet people as people and you understand the pattern and issues, you know, what drives them, what makes them make the decisions they do, you can always work out a solution that's good for both parties. That's my secret. A lot of decisions, by the time they get to the boardroom, you've best discussed them over coffee, over tea or over dinner. So if you have a chance, eat with people, get to know somebody you think is an opponent because you might actually find out that's not an opponent, that's a comrade. How do you measure your own performance at work? My matrix is when I'm leaving the office, uh, in the morning, I have a list of things I want to do. When I get up in the morning, I write my to-do list. At the end of the day, I try to cross what I have done. But again, when I'm in the office and I'm leaving the office, am I smiling? If I'm smiling, I might not have done half the things on my list, but the me I'm taking home is still a happy me. And I don't believe in working till you're miserable and bringing home the remnants of you that are shattered. With success comes failure. What is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? My biggest failure has actually been attached to one of my biggest successes. I worked really, really hard to secure a project for five years. I had numerous troubles, meetings, negotiations, set up a new entity. Uh, we got the contract we were supposed to start it and then it was shelved and then it never happened. And that was five years of my life that went down the drain. And the failure in that success was I sacrificed so much. I sacrificed holidays with my children. I remember leaving the family to run to a meeting. I left them in Italy. I sacrificed nights of sleep, family events, a wedding, a funeral, because this was so important. I let life be. And then at the end of it, I got it. But what happened? It never happened. And so I think some of our biggest failures are with our biggest successes that we put works so high up on the pedestal that we let life vanish. We let life be. And I have made way too many of those sacrifices in my earlier years. And I've learned that now. What is inspiring and motivates you the most in your role and career right now? So many things. So much is happening in the world. So much is transitioning. I think there is an opportunity to open or to dive into the atmosphere of change that we have right now. And that really motivates me. A lot of young people come in in the industry with lots of fresh ideas, lots of creative ways of working. Uh, we've got high tech. A lot is happening. The tech industry is just busting. And if we can only use some of the juices and the fruits of this, if we can take AI, for example, if we can get that better into healthcare, you know, what can we do? What diseases can we solve? What can we solve? What are human suffering can we leverage? That's so exciting. Uh, where can we use all this? It's just a wealth of knowledge. And um, yeah, it's mind boggling. Let us now jump into the influence of mentors, role models, champions, and sponsors. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, champions can stand up and advocate for us and open up the world of possibilities. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our career. Winifred, do you have a mentor, champion, or a sponsor today? I do have a mentor, but I don't have a sponsor and I don't have a champion. On the other hand, because I don't have that, I do that for others. Who is your role model you look up to in your field? I don't have a role model in my field. This is a very, very young field. However, I have role models in life. And I think one of my biggest role models in this life is Dame Norma Wade Miller, who is a retired Supreme Court judge in Bermuda, a historical woman, first of her kind in so many fields, a whole pot of wisdom and encouragement. History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors, champions, and sponsors in business than women. So Winifred, how important do you think is to have a mentor, champion, and sponsor during one's career? I have not had one and I have been lucky. But for those I have been mentoring, it has made a difference. It has helped them to get into roles or to develop their careers or to harness their talents better. And it just helps to have somebody who's a sounding board and somebody who's also older, who's been burnt before, you know, jumped through the hoops and huddles before and can help guide you through it. So it is important. And I, I wish we had more of that. But I think in Scandinavia, it's a new thing. It was not something that was mentioned when I was starting my career mentorship. 
it, then you have to elbow your way to get in one. I miss that. Let's move on to leadership. Adena Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq, said, I quote, empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And Shirley Samber, ex-CEO of Facebook, said, I quote, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Winifred, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership to me is helping others to grow together in their group or in the team to achieve success together. For me, leadership is a bit like gardening. It's removing the weeds so that they can grow. It's preparing the field before you plant them so you know that the right person is in the right place and they have got the right nourishment. It is knowing that the plant has the right amount of sunshine. This plant prefers a shade. This one prefers full sun. This one is half sun. That is leadership. It's basically quite that simple. It's like farming. Because when you get that balance right, you see how all your plants thrive. What do you consider a good versus a bad leader? A good leader is one that is tending to others to grow. A bad leader is one who is in it to shine and grow alone. I would say a bad leader is like a strangular fig. A strangular fig will grow on the stem of another tree, basically use that stem to climb back to get to the sun. The point of that strangular fig is to get as high as possible to get the sun. And in the process, its stem grows and it strangles the stem on which it grew. And so a bad leader will strangle an organization basically to get to the sun because their objective is really not to grow the tree on which they are leaning, but rather to get to the sun. Who is your favorite tech leader and why? My favorite tech leader? I don't have any. How would you describe yourself as a leader? When I have been asked what I do in the company, I say I'm the janitor. Because a janitor is a leader. You change the light bulbs. You keep the stairs clean. That's safety so people don't fall. The lights so people can see where they're going and what they're doing. I make people laugh and bring my people together. For me, leadership is about creating that arena, that forum where at the end of the day, those people go home in a loving mood to their family. I don't want anybody under my watch going home just wanting to fall to pieces or strangle their family. Because as leaders, we have a profound effect on the lives of others, not just the eight hours they're at work, but actually before they get to work and after they get to work and what they carry to bed with them. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? Honesty, humility, patience. What leadership lessons have you learned that have formed you into the leader you are today? Some of the best leadership lessons I've learned are from the absolute worst despicable leaders. And what I say is, I don't want to be like this guy. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? According to the personality test that I've done, highest on my strengths is humor. No, actually highest was kindness. Number two was humor. Number three is love of learning. And I think that sums it up. I'm a very curious person and I love to keep things light around me. And weakness? I'm kind and kindness is both a strength and a weakness because sometimes I tend to be too kind and too accommodating others and situations. I am impatient. That's why I could never be an astronaut because I could never send something to Jupiter and wait for it for 40 years to get there. I want to do things chop, 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 chop. I am impatient. I would say I'm kind of a closet perfectionist, even if I try really hard not to show it. But doing stuff, mediocre work is kind of gives me the itches. I like things to be done correctly. Either you do it or you don't do it. But it doesn't have to be perfect. Just give it your best or just, you know, do it right. That's it. But don't do something sloppy intentionally. That drives me nuts. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today. Workplace culture. Unlocking the power of diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Winifred, what does diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging mean to you personally? I would say I'm a round peg in a square hole in most situations. I'm a black woman. I'm an immigrant in a very white country in an industry that has possibly the lowest percentage of people of color. That makes me uh, a minority in every setting. And in the last 20 years of my career, if not more, it is odd for me to come to a meeting and find somebody who looks like me. I'm happy to see that there are a lot more women in the room 
but there are still very few black people and definitely almost no black women in my field or in the fields that I have worked with in this country and in a lot of other countries. So yes, I feel odd. Headhunter asked me to describe how I see myself and I say I see myself as a dandelion in a perfectly manicured lawn. What do you consider being three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company? If I walk into the company space, uh, what do I see? Do I see anybody who looks like me or perhaps thinks like me? Uh, when I look at the management, does it reflect the diversity of the market, the diversity of the service group or the diversity of where they want to be? Or is it a unison board? Is it a unison management team? And then when you enter the building, what do you feel in the pits of your stomach? Is it a relaxed environment? Is there a friendliness? Is there a warmth in this place that tells you I might be the only one of my kind, but I'm good here. I can grow here. I will be accepted here. And you feel that. It's like a thick sense, at least uh, I do. As a Black immigrant woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? The biggest barrier was actually coming for interviews. When I was in the university, I would apply for summer job after summer job, never really got any meaningful summer job, always ended up washing the floor in the local hospital. And I heard stories of others like me who applied for hundreds and hundreds of jobs and uh, never got called for interviews. And back then, because I'm as old as I am, you actually had to send physical applications with certified copies. So you went to a copy shop copied your papers, paid per copy, stamped them, certified them as correct, paid postage, real stamps, licked the bloody stamp on the envelope, sent it, and you had nothing. So just sending applications as a student was a bankrupting operation. So every time somebody sent back your application saying, sorry, you didn't get the job, you were actually happy because they saved you the copying fees. It was active recycling, take these papers in the net envelope and go. But the worst were the ones that actually never responded. So when I finished my education, I told myself, I'm too old for this shit. So this is what I'm going to do. The first paragraph in my application, I am a Norwegian woman of African descent, and I'm very proud of my culture and heritage and who I am. And if this is not acceptable in your company, I do not want to work for you either. I made that plainly clear the first paragraph introducing myself. So there was no misunderstanding what I look like and my picture on my CV from day one. It's just me. You take me the full hula baloo or nothing at all. And I think because I was so confrontational about it, I ended up coming to interviews and I had interviews where HR was spent the interview just trying to defend their policy of equal opportunities. So rather than me fighting to get it, now they were fighting to convince me that actually we don't have such a policy and most companies don't have such a policy. It's just an inherent bias that happens. So that's how I got my first job. So I got multiple offers. And since then, I've just been able to sail from one job to the next. Kudos to you. Why do you think it's important for more women, non-binary and transgenders to join the tech industry today? A little bit of courage on their part to actually dare to come in. Because if you don't dare put yourself out there, you're never going to get it. And for them to do that, for them to dare, they need to see more of us out there to actually hear our stories, say, hey, you know what? I was as odd as they come and here I am and I'm actually thriving and we're actually fun people. What I like about tech in general is that, yes, we are all human. We've all got our biases, but compared to other industries, I think we are more open to a cranial diversity. That is what's in your head. If you're good at something, you could be a giraffe to just bring it on board. So just that, it may look scary from the outside, but dare to come in. And at the same time, you will be accepted as you are. It may be difficult, maybe the first steps, opening any door into a dark room is always scary, but there's a light switch in there. Do you and how do you speak with your colleagues, peers and community about the DIB challenges, for example, salary gaps and promotions? I challenge my organization on hiring. The focus on the company, which I've seen in my organization, is really diverse and kudos to our HR and to our teams. Uh, that is focus on know-how, focus on competence, and you will get that diversity because it's not like competence is locked in one particular race or culture or orientation. No, there's an equal distribution. There's smarts everywhere. You get the right smart for the right job, you will get that person. And at the same time, seek to pull people out. 
If you have a bunch of CVs only from a very homogeneous group, then you might be looking in the wrong place. Seek multiple arenas where you can draw different people in and salaries. Thankfully, in our industry, got benchmarks from Tecna, from the trade union that guide these things. So the disparity is not that big. But again, this is something that I've been very aware of. And in my own situation, on one occasion, actually challenged my boss to say, hey, you know what, I'll actually just stop with that based on where I am. There's a disparity in my salary and this is not where I should be. And he was very good about it and just corrected it right away. So we have to be, I think, creating awareness of is this right? Is this correct? Is this based that salary on competence? Forget gender, forget everything else. This is the confidence. This is what you're bringing to the table. And that's what you're paid for. There are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women of color, non-binary and transgenders face from reaching higher position in the tech industry. How do you feel has affected is affecting you? And what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? I think that we generally don't ask. We expect to be promoted Without asking, we expect that, oh, I work so hard and I deliver all these good results. So they should see it and they should promote me. But actually, this is show that men are much better at asking or putting forward that request and saying, hey, I want to make manager or I want to make senior manager within this time. And this is how I want to do it. They talk about it. We want to be courted. We want to be wooed in that position. We want to be recognized. And I think that is something we have to recognize has not served us well in the past and will not serve us. So I think a little bit of boldness. And unfortunately, I think there's a conditioning. The girl child is brought up to be nice, to wait for your turn. So we are conditioned as children while the boys are more go get it. So I think we have to start breaking that barrier already from kids, our juniors, to say, hey, you know what? Ask. Because most of the time when you ask, you actually get it. Today, tech companies spend a lot of marketing money to attract women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders. However, at the same time, they're finding it hard to retain them. Article shows that women are leaving the tech industry. What is your best advice on strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity and equity? Let's go back to the farming idea. If you get good seed and you plant it in a patch of soil that is rocky and full of root and is dry, patched, what's going to grow? The plant may germinate, but it will struggle. It's not going to bloom. Why? Because the conditions, the fundamental conditions need to be in place for any human being to thrive. And that's going back to what is the environment? What are the conditions? What is it that I, as a woman at this stage in my life, need to thrive? What balance do I need? Again, how do I leave the office? Do I leave the office and I sit in tears? Do I leave the office completely knackered and I see I'm not getting value for my time? I feel exploited or I feel abused. I feel used to the core. I don't see a sense of longevity in this. There's a self-preservation that kicks in that says, you know what? This is not worth it. So you want women to thrive. You want anything to thrive. Again, I did agriculture as an elective subject when I was in boarding school, and I go back to it. If you want your plants to look well, make sure the conditions in which you plant them are right. Make sure you're watering them right, exposing them to the right amount of sunshine they need in order to thrive. What would you say are the few challenges of implementing a DIB culture in a workplace today? Disconnect. DIY has sometimes in certain companies, it feels like it's a buzzword or it's just a something for show, it's something for statistics and something to put in the annual report, something to report on, take a box. You look at the leadership, there's zero reflection of that diversity that is being talked about. You look at the company policies, there's zero diversity. It's not sunk into it or the company culture. Then you have some policies. This is what we are going to do. You pull in some people, take the box, you have your alibi, but the conditions are not there. The culture is not there that is set for these people to feel included, to thrive. And it's not just thrive. As diverse people, we don't come to work because it's a charity thing or because we feel good. Actually, we come to work because we've got competence. We can contribute. We've got so much bubbling in us. We want to create value. That's really it. We want to create value. I don't want to be an alibi. That's our black person. 
No, I'm sitting where I am because I'm creating value. I think that in a lot of organizations, that thought is missing. And so that disconnects. You bring in diversity as a tick box exercise or diverse people as a box ticking exercise without creating the conditions for them to thrive, without actually having a culture that is embracing where they feel included or without having this rooted in management. There's always a blah, blah, blah. This is our policy, yada, yada, yada. But it's not in the blood. It's not in the vein of the company. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from having not just women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders, but actually higher gender representation at C-suite level and boardrooms with actual mandate? At that level or at most levels, since the Industrial Revolution, we are not doing manual work. So you can say a man is stronger than a woman. Again, you're not lifting me off the building, so you don't need that muscle. What we are doing in that room or what we're doing as leaders is cranial work. So that mental diversity is so important because we see the world through the lenses that we have, how we grew up, where we come from, what challenges we have accomplished. We solve problems differently. And it's that diversity of thought that brings that creativity to the table and helps to bring a company forward. Now, sometimes we got visual diversity. That is, you're sitting in a room with people who apparently look different, but they've all gone to the same university. They're all born, they're all bred or conditioned the same way. That's not diversity. That serves the company because what you're looking for is diversity or thought that is based on experience and the lived experience. An example is, and this is a funny one, when COVID started and I was looking at everybody running to go and stock up on toilet paper. And I'm thinking, holy gross, are we getting diarrhea or dysentery? Now, if you had people who have actually, let's say, in the crisis leadership team, who let's say we've been through a war, actual war, or grown up in a war, and the toilet paper is the least of your worries when you're fleeing. What is it you need to stock up on? It's not toilet paper, people. It's just that simple experience that you bring on board right away. <laughs> I'm going for onions, <laughs> not toilet paper. How much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding the IB since you joined? It has changed quite a bit. When I started on my matriculation day, I looked around in my faculty. There was no black person except me. Uh, during the breaks, I was looking desperately for any sign of black life. And there wasn't any. That was me. There was just me, at least from the starting. Finally, in the middle of the day, I met a lady from Ethiopia who was a Norad student going to do her PhD. And it was like, oh, Hallelujah, Jesus. And I managed to find other people. But when I go to the university right now, that's my litmus test. And I see the diversity. I see more people like me. I see Asians. I see Africans. I see South Americans. Our university, which was at that point, everybody that's white except me. I think there were a few girls with Vietnamese origin. And, and that was it. Now, I go back there and I'm standing in the main corridor. We call it Stripa. And looking at life's past and I see the future and it is diverse. It's eclectic. It's absolutely beautiful. It's all hairstyles and colors and the short people, the tall people. And it's beautiful to see because that gives me hope. They're coming in, first generation immigrants, second generation, third generation, never been immigrant, never been out to Scandinavia. Everybody is there. And that enriches that thought, that cranial pool, that mental diversity that we need at the end of the day, is improved. Looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? I think I would have worried less about what other people thought. I spent so much of my life walking on glass and trying to please everybody, trying to fit in. And I learned this from school. There was assimilation and integration are not the same thing. I spent most of my life in my early careers trying to be assimilated, to erase me so I could fit in. And if I could go back now, I would say I want to be integrated, not assimilated. And the way I explain this is it's like a Christmas cake. Uh, and the best Christmas cake in the world is the Jamaican cake, the black cake. You soak all these good bits, the, the dried fruits and the nuts and all that in rum for six months. They all take up all the good juice and then you bake it. But when you eat the cake, 
the raisin is the raisin. The raisin has the, it's got the rum in it. It's got the taste of the other ingredients in it, but it's still a raisin. It has not suddenly turned into a walnut or something. And that's what I miss. If I could go back, I want to soak the juices and learnings from everybody around me without losing the essence of me. Looking forward, what will you do as a leader to improve the bias for the next generation of women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders in tech? I just want to be a possibility of opening doors for others. The best thing I can do, I think a lot of us who fall out of the box or who are round in square holes have a lot of know-how, but we don't technical know who. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you know if you don't know anybody and you cannot get in. What I can do where I am now is to lift others, to introduce them to my network, to guide them or to drop their names in those closed rooms, to recommend them so they too can get in. Because the more you get in, the more others can. Let's say I pull five people in and these five people each pull five people in. It's better than the COVID R number. The COVID R number I think was only at two. So if we make this five, just five, we are changing the world basically. Let us move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Winfried, you have without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? I laugh a lot. I think laughter is like a painkiller. And actually in my mother's clan, uh, our creed is to laugh. And it says, laugh at the world. That at creation, we got very white teeth so that when challenges come, we can laugh and show what we are made of. I laugh a lot and I read the living. I write comics. I try to keep my mind non-gloomy. I run, or at least I used to run. I love being out. And I love the time when I can actually be alone or alone with my dog to sort things out or to get a sense of silence around me. Have you ever experienced burnout? I've been very close, yes. How do you tackle it? To drop that, the expectations, other people's expectations. I've found that I carried expectations that were not mine and tried to please everybody around me, is left and center, and tried to do more than I should have said yes to. And this is a lesson that a lot of young women need to learn. We are chronically bad at saying no. And it's yes and yes. And again, it's culture. We are taught to always say yes, to be obedient, to always accept and be nice and be kind. So you just accept and you take on and take on until in the end, there is nothing left and your cup is empty. No, it's not empty. It's empty. It's dry. It's a bone. What I'm working on and I'm still learning is that two letter word, no. To say no and to set clear boundaries. I don't have to carry the world on my shoulders alone to accept my mortality, to accept I'm not in finite, to accept that. And to know this is what I can do to the best of my abilities and the rest I cannot do. And it's okay. What is advice over companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in a new now? I think companies need to be realistic and observant. Again, it's about people. I worked in a company, Arca Solutions, many years ago, and we had an HSE campaign, which was just care. And I remember there was a loadout operation and one of the engineers had possibly been working so hard. And the others around him went to his boss and said, you know what? He's really been working so many hours now. He must be tired. And the boss called him and said, you are going to go home and sleep. We'll continue the loadout without you. Why? He had a sense of responsibility. People that burn out don't burn out because they're bored. They burn out because they're passionate about what they're doing and they really want to do more. And that taught me that it was his colleagues that saw. It was his colleagues that said, hey, this guy needs to go home. When we say, what does the company need to do? I said, no, what do you need to do? How do you see the guy in your next cubicle or your neighbor sitting next to you, how they are doing and how can you support them and how can they support you? Somebody sitting on their desk, tears rolling down their faces, you just turn the other way or you go, hey, my friend, what's going on? Are you all right? It's us. When we say, what should the company do? We read ourselves of that responsibility and that doesn't sit well with me. It's about people and we are all responsible. We are each other's keepers. We are each other's minders. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? 
First of all, my dog barks very early, so whether I like it or not, I have to get up. It's just so much to do, so much fun, and there's so many good people out there to talk to, and the world's changing, and we're a part of it, and that motivates me. I want to get out there. Now, let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Winifred, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? This too shall pass. When you face obstacles and you think the world is going under, these two shall pass. And then what is the worst advice you've ever been given and how did you tackle it? Face this head on. And that's solid advice, but it's bad advice. And there are some problems you can face head on. There's some challenges you can face head on, but there's some things that are not worth your energy or your time to face head on. There are some people or some situations that are just impossible. And sometimes turning around and walking away is the best possible thing you can do. Is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? I wish I could play the piano. Music is very soothing and it's one of those things that can pull me out of any sort of pattern. And rather than do it myself, I think I pushed my kids through all kinds of music instruments. So I lived through them, but I would have wanted to learn the piano. So I had a mental getaway where I could think in peace or just not think at all. If you had the ability to go back in time to when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? Take it easy. It's not all on you and be kind to yourself. It's okay to go home with work and finished. The world's not going to go under. It's okay. What advice would you give to young girls, women of color, non-binary and transgenders who want and trying to break into STEM fields today, especially wanting to become next generation leaders? Welcome on board. Just jump in. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be fun and lots of hurdles along the way. Seek us out. Seek people. You have no mentor. Create one. Reach out. Don't be afraid to send an email to somebody you've never met before. Say, hey, you know what? I really think you're cool and I could do with some advice and blah. And you know what? Many of us are out here hungry to pull people into the industry. We are here. And we have managed and yes, we've gone through some interesting situations, scenarios, adventures and all that, which we might spare you. So just call, just reach out. You're not alone in any way. Last but not least, what is next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? Right now, I just want to finish my PhD in crisis leadership. And then I want to see what the next will be. I'm very open-minded at the moment. The world's full of challenging problems that we need to solve. And with technology with us, I think we're in a really good place now if we can harness our collective intelligence to solve some of these problems. So it's exciting. Thank you so much, Winfred, for being a guest on the Queen's of Tech podcast, sharing your journey with, without a doubt, inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders in tech. Thank you for having me. It's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.